What is going on, my loveliest free melons? I'm Eli Martyr, and thank you for joining me here on the Free Melon Society today. Right now, as, as I'm speaking to you, just about to jump into my fifth day without food or water. And feeling good, you know, feeling well, I'll, I'll get into how I felt, you know, day to day in just a bit. But I wanted to go through a couple of the protocols and some some theory of dry fasting with you guys today and then just show some some clips about how i spent my days the internet is populated with a lot of just really bad information about dry fasting okay there's a lot of good information too don't get me wrong lots of good information but there's also some bad information as well particularly with breaking the fast i mean oh my god Guys, uh, don't break your your dry fast like a like a generic YouTuber. Okay, God, it, it's funny because when when I'm on a, a cleanse like this, it's fun. You go and watch videos just to see how other people have have done it, and there are people out there breaking fasts with chicken uh, and intricate concoctions. I saw some some lady using a microwave to heat up like this smoothie of some sort. It's just like, oh my God, guys. Dry fasting is serious, okay? This is the best, the deepest, the most powerful and potent natural mechanism to, to instigate a healing phenomenon in your body that is reaching into the deepest levels of your physical being and correcting errors and pulling out toxins from their dormant homes in your cells. And it's doing this with, with this, with a fervor that you really don't find in any other healing modality. Dry fasting is so powerful and it must be respected. And the fast needs to, or sorry, the break on the fast needs to be respected as well. So anyway, we'll get into all that. Okay. So how did I feel during the dry fast? Uh, day one was uneventful, nothing to speak of. I went to work as normal. I had fight choreography, I did some wire work. Uh, it's a regular day of work, nothing to speak of. Day one felt fantastic, felt like I was fully fed the whole day. Day two also felt great, exercising, doing my normal routine for the day. By the end of day two, I went to bed a bit early. I started to feel a little bit lethargic, closer to the middle, late evening. And so went to bed nice and early and got really, really, really good sleep. It's around that second day when some of your sleep will start to get a little disrupted. When I say disrupted, it's just that you have an abundance of energy now because you're not digesting food. By the time you get to that second night, you're probably gonna be waking up at odd hours in the evening with some energy and you, know, you might not know what to do. You're, you might wanna read. Uh, that's what I did. I did a lot of reading in the evening. So it's around that day two mark where you can start to expect not to sleep for a solid like six hours straight, okay? So that's something you can expect. Day three, oh, it's the magic day now in terms of the phenomenon, what happens to your body during a dry fast. But day three also felt very, very good. Um, still, no hunger, no, no thirst to speak of. You feel just like, you just feel this baseline energetic wellness. And you really start to get there on day three. Depending on the person, you might start, you might feel ebbs and ebbs and flows and how lethargic you are, you're definitely going to be, you'll be energetic. And I felt good and good energetic and very strong. So I did feel all that. However, you're, you're not, it's not like you're going to be wanting to do explosive things. Okay. You're going to be moving slowly. You'll be very calm. So by day three, you are, you are getting into that deeper, deeper cleansing, deeper, deeper healing. So it can be very unpredictable when you feel lethargic and you might want to lie down. Uh, other times you'll just feel good and want to be productive, do some reading, do whatever. I still enjoyed doing a little bit of activity throughout the day. Uh, at, at random intervals, uh, different parts of the day. And then I would just take it easy, read, relax, lie down for a bit if I wanted to or felt. So any mix of these things you could start experiencing around that time.
Day four is a repeat of day three, really, in terms of the fluctuations of how you could feel. Today I spent my day doing a little bit of activity in the morning, some, some exercise in the morning, and then I went downtown to support some of the freedom movement going on down there. Uh, Stand for the one of the one of the freedom groups that's giving out information. The halo illness and all the social engineering and propaganda associated with that. So I went down to support their little workshop today and then got back home just had ran some errands just taking it easy and taking it easy and of course filming this this lecture on dry dressing so that was my day four and then tomorrow i'll head to the beach for a bit the day that i break fast so the general consensus though is that you feel good the whole time you feel good you feel very very good the whole time if you want to try dry fasting you will experience lethargy that's the main thing that you can guaranteed expect to to feel you are going to want to lie down at times as you go deeper and deeper into your days You'll be less excitable, you'll probably move more slowly and methodically. If you are lying down, you don't want to like get up abruptly. Some people might get brain rushes, you know. Go about your day a bit more slowly and just delicately, okay? That's, that's pretty much how it goes, but you feel very, very good. Everything gets really, really cl cleaned out. Interestingly, I had more bowel movements during this five day dry fast than I did on a lengthier water fast. The last time I did a long water fast, I, I, I might have had two bowel movements throughout the whole ordeal. And on this one, I think I had about three bowel movements during the five day, uh, during the, this five day cleanse. So that was interesting. So a couple of things I just want to address about dry fasting. Okay. Are you, are you being dehydrated? And is this dehydration dangerous for the body. And so this is something I want to address. So there's a book that I highly recommend if you're interested in dry fasting. If you're actually into the literature of dry fasting, you're probably familiar with Dr. Sergei Filonov. So you can buy his books and you can read up all about it. Uh, very, very meticulously researched uh, material. There's also a Dr. Shenikov, I believe, if I'm pronouncing the name right, who has also done extensive research into dry fasting, particularly dry fasting. I want to share some material from, oops, from this book, which is The Phoenix Protocol by August, oh sorry, by August Dunning. And there's some really, it gets into some really, really, really good information in here. Um, why I like this book, it's heavily, heavily, heavily referenced and resourced. So this book is drawing on just page after page after page after page of studies on on fasting and dry fast and starvation and what happens to just it's meticulously resourced. So are you being dehydrated when you're on a dry fast? Okay, the answer is no. You're, you're not you're not being dehydrated when you're on a dry fast. For one thing, you actually increase the amount of urine that you produce as you go deeper into the fast, okay? So on day one of a dry fast, you'll have whatever amount of urine that you that you excrete, and day two, a similar amount. But as you get into day three and day four, it's interesting that the amount of urine that you excrete starts to increase. So if you're excreting more urine as you get deeper into the cleanse, this water is obviously coming from somewhere, okay? You're getting a source of water. It's not just coming out of nowhere. All right. So where's that water coming from? Well, it's coming from the breakdown of fatty tissue inside of your body. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. So there are two. There are two pathways by which the body sources water during a dry fast. Okay. So you've got two ways that your body is going to get water during this dry fast. The first way that this happens. So when you stop drinking water and eating food, okay, your body goes into a stressed state and your blood, the, the amount of dissolved particles in your blood, their concentration increases. So what happens is the higher concentration of dissolved solids in your blood is, dis is detected by your body. Okay. And this higher concentration of dissolved solids signals to your pituitary gland to secrete ADH or antidiuretic hormone. Okay. So basically you stop drinking water. And your pituitary gland gets the gets the signal that it needs to tell the body to oh wait okay we need to hold on to water because nothing is coming in okay so far are you with me and I drew a little diagram here maybe I can flash it on the screen uh, in my notes so it, this this is how I remembered it 
So your pituitary gland releases this antidiuretic hormone because it wants to start holding on to water as it detects that the body is not being fed with water from the outside world. Now, this antidiuretic hormone, what this does is this it signals to the adrenal cortex, to the adrenal medulla and the kidneys to stimulate the production of epinephrine. Okay, so so far you're with me. So you stop drinking water, the blood gets a bit thicker, there are more dissolved particles in the blood. The osmoreceptors detect this and say, holy crap, no water. Off to the pituitary gland to secrete this antidiuretic hormone. And then that antidiuretic hormone, once in circulation, signals to the kidney, to the adrenal uh, medulla on the kidneys to produce epinephrine, kind of that fight or flight hormone. Now, once you get here in the pathway, epinephrine, it signals to the body to ramp up its production of growth hormone, things like uh, insulin-like growth hormone and other muscle sparing hormones, muscle preserving growth hormones. This is why you will find that people enjoy exercising when they're doing really short dry fasts. So after about 24 hours or so, then they go and exercise. And because their body is starting to release this growth hormone, okay, it's an expedient time to exercise and then they eat after, right? But anyway, that's besides the point. So this epinephrine is produced and the epinephrine is what the body uses to signal and start the process of lipolysis, where it's going to find fat in your body and it's going to cleave the fatty acids from the, the glyceryl backbone. So a fatty acid is made up of a glyceryl backbone and free fatty acids attached to it. I'm not gonna get into the biochemistry, but the epinephrine is a major cue, clue, uh, cue to your body to increase lipolysis and, and produce lipases which is an enzyme that breaks apart those fatty acids and makes energy from them. Those free fatty acids are full of hydrogens, okay? So what, what happens is your body breaks apart those free fatty acids and then the oxygen that you get from the air combines with these hydrogens from the free fatty acids and it makes water, right? So what's happening is you are getting water from the breakdown of these fatty acids in your body. So with about 100 grams of fat, you will produce about 115 uh, grams of water. Endogenous water, the cleanest and purest type of water that is possible to get, that you are getting when you are dry fasting, okay? So that's one way that you can get water when you're dry fasting. The other way that you can get water when you're dry fasting is in this state, in this water-deprived state, your body targets and goes after in a very muscle sparing way. So sparing the vital protein structures of the muscle mass, okay, it goes after only dead and decayed uh, proteins in the body and muscle mass that is weak or degenerate. It goes after scar tissue, okay, and breaks those down for water and amino acids to build structure. It goes after cysts, it goes after tumors, it goes after senescent cells, senescent meaning like senility, think old age, like dead and dying cells, okay? It goes after anything and everything that is not a, a well-functioning muscle protein or muscle cell, and it breaks those things down for water and amino acids, and the amino acids are used to build structure, um, to rebuild structure, okay? So th those are the two ways that your body is hydrating during a water fast, during, during a dry fast, excuse me, which, which helps to explain why you're not actually thirsty during a dry fast, because you are getting this very pure source of water when you are dry fasting. So I hope that satisfies just a little bit. If you want more information, you can go read the book yourself. But this is just off the top of my head from the notes that I took, and I'm summarizing it for you so you get the main idea. So this is why you're not thirsty during a dry fast, because you're getting this very pure internal um, fusion, right? This internal production of high quality body water. Now, what's interesting is that the dry fast tends to be, as I mentioned before, more muscle sparing than a water fast. I'll read you a bit from the appendix here, because there's a, there's a, a part in the appendix that um, deals with why water fasting is a bit more muscle punishing <laughs> than a dry fast. Right. 
Energy production during fasting is very different when you're drinking water. The total dissolved solids in the blood is low, and the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus are not stimulated to signal the posterior pituitary gland to release ADH. So as you remember earlier, like I said, when you're dry fasting, the dissolved solid content is high because you're not drinking water. But when you're drinking water, the content is lower, so your body is not stimulated to produce this antidiuretic hormone because you're getting all the water from the water fast, okay? So continuing on, you have plenty of water. Without ADH, the adrenal medulla isn't stimulated to release epinephrine to stimulate lipolysis. Lipolysis meaning the, the cleaving of lipids. So the cleaving of lipids, lipolysis, the, the breakdown of fat. Without epinephrine, lipase isn't activated to unlock glycerol and fatty acids stored in the fat. When there's no signal to stimulate epinephrine to dig into fat stores, bracket, since you're fully hydrated, close bracket, glucose is then temporarily produced from glycogen stored in skeletal muscle. Thereafter, with glycogen exhausted and glycerol unavailable from fat cells, Hepatocytes in the liver start synthesizing glucose through gluconeogenesis using pyruvate, lactate, lactate, and glucogenic amino acids, primarily alanine, taken from the skeletal muscle tissue. Okay, we're getting into a lot of like jargony stuff here that is very easy to kind of fly over the head that, uh, you know, to, I, I don't like talking about, you know, in this way because I like to be very, very easy to understand. So... Uh, I don't know how much more I want to read here, but that kind of just give you a general feel, right? Yeah, so there's a lot of like jargony talk that, you know, is best to get into only if you want to, you know, really dig into the kind of stuff. And you know what? I'm not going to continue reading because, yeah, it's it's a bit jargony and I, I, I try to stay away from that. There's one more thing I'd like to talk to you about today with dry fasting. When you're doing dry fasting, okay, ideally, you want to get past the two-day mark. There's a magic thing that happens when you deplete all of your muscle, your muscle glycogen. And that is muscle and liver glycogen. And when that happens, that's when the, the potent effects of autophagy kick in. Autophagy meaning self-eating. So it's at that time that your body is going to start targeting the fat cells and is going to start eating up the dead, dying, and decaying weak cells in your body for energy. And that's the, that's really where the healing, uh, starts to get deep in the dry fast. And that only happens around the two day mark. So you have to get by that two day mark and go into your third day and beyond if you want to really reap the benefits of the dry fast. Okay. That does not mean that nothing is happening if you're doing a 24, 36 hour, 48 hour dry fast. There's lots of good happening. And for the new, and for the newbies out there, I would not recommend going into a dry fast if you are not experienced in cleansing or fasting or water fasting prior to. I would recommend, A, before anything, cleaning up your diet, okay? You know, if you're on the standard anywhere diet or even conventional healthy diet that includes animal products and lots of cooked food and seasonings and sauces and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, I, I would urge you to get away from all of that, right? and get into a clean raw food diet first then if you want to get into some fasting you can go on a juice cleanse get some cleaning going go on a on a water fast go on a whatever five day water fast get get that under your belt get some experience there and then you can start experimenting with dry fasting so it's de it's definitely a process that's ultra powerful but it needs to be respected it needs to be respected if you're just an anything eater, including restaurant food often and carcasses and chicken menstrual products, cheese and whatever, all this nonsense, then dry fasting, you're, then you're going to go through dry fasting not like I go through it. You're going to experience headaches, you're going to be dizzy, you're going to feel like crap, you know, but I go through dry fasts and I feel fantastic. I'm, I'm Again, I'm giving this lecture to you right now uh, on my fifth day of no food, no water. Okay, and had I not told you, you would never be able to tell that in front of you is a starving man, a starving man, all right? Breaking the fast. Okay, now there's a lot of material about breaking the fast, and a lot of it's contradictory. Um, 
There are many approaches that you can take within reason. I tend to be very simple, as you know. <laughs> um, I have always broken dry fasts, starting with just a little bit of water and then going into some fluids and then getting into just fruit, either way later on that day or, or save it to the next day. Depending on the length of your fast, you might want to go multiple days of just fluids, okay, first. And then you can introduce solid foods. And when I say solid foods, I mean fruit. Okay. Fruit primarily, eventually, you know, after a day or two, then maybe some, some vegetables if, if you choose. But your transition back into eating has to be so, has to be very, very gradual and delicate because your system is, is so sensitive now in this fasted state that you need to ease it back into motion. I also can't help but imagine that animals in nature, when they're injured, so let's say an angel, uh, an angel, what the hell is an angel? Uh, let's say an animal has to deal with an injury, like a broken arm or something. That animal, for dog owners, you, you guys have probably seen this. If your dog has a broken arm or something, it, it starts fasting and does, it doesn't drink or eat. And it'll just sit there. And this happens in nature. And these animals are, are dry fasting. And they don't have the luxury, really, of making these human intellectual breaking protocols. They All they can do is either find water and drink it from a water source, or they eat just their, their, their natural species-specific diet. That's it. That's the only way an animal can break a dry fast in nature. And I have to imagine that it would be that simple for human beings as well. However you want to play it, right? When you're breaking a dry fast, you're looking at two things. Water and fruit. That is how you're going to break your dry fast. Start with water, just a little bit. So maybe about an, an eight ounce glass of water, you might want to take the first hour of your day to sip slowly on this eight ounces of water. Okay, once you take an hour to get through eight ounces of water, you can maybe take the next hour to get through another eight ounces of water. Very slowly, just sipping on water. That's how you would start to break your dry fast. Okay, once you do that for a couple hours, maybe then you can start doing the same type of thing with either coconut water or even some fruit juice. All right, I wouldn't really even feel so badly about very, very, very sparingly eating uh, watermelon or some other melon or any high water content fruit. Just, just nibbling on that to, to break my fast. I mean, I would find that perfectly fine and acceptable as well. That's how you would have to do it in, in nature if you didn't have a water source near you. You will find people saying you need to add this and that to your water. You might find people that recommend uh, baking soda, you know, a little, a teaspoon of baking soda in the water to alkalize the system because the kidneys are going to be uh, dealing with all of this acid so the the baking soda in the water is supposed to help remineralize the body and then de so yada 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 if you want to try that in your with the water uh, you can go for that I, I don't I don't want to knock it too much because I know that there, there are apparently many benefits to doing that I've never broken a dry fast like that before I'm very tempted to try it you know this time try a teaspoon of aluminum free baking soda in my in my water for breaking the dry fast. I'm tempted to only because I'm obligated to experiment on my body for your benefit. And so I'm, I'm tempted to do it just so I can report something to you and just tell you how it is. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm a bit on the fence with that. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I will do that tomorrow, but um, anyhow, if you chose to do it in your practice, uh, you know, Go for it. Try it. See how it works. I think most people do it and they're fine. I, in fact, I don't think anybody who's broken their fast with water and a bit of baking soda has had any detrimental effects um, that I know of. So I'm sure you'd be fine to do it. it it's just me. I, I think I have a preference to avoid that kind of stuff. I mean, the baking soda process, when you make baking soda, it's a, it's a chemical process requiring heat and ammonia and just like, I don't know, it's just... I can't help but feel dissuaded from going that route. Fruit and water. That's, that's, or fruit juices. Okay. That's probably the best way to break a dry fast. 
Okay, that's it for now, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Give this video a like to help with the rankings. And uh, make sure to subscribe to the Free Melon Society if you haven't subscribed before. If you have questions, if you have comments, if you're curious about dry fasting and you want to learn more, um, you know, reach out to me, you can ask me or just give me a comment. I will do my best to try and answer. Um, again, this is one of the first couple videos that I've made since being very, very busy in, uh, this year on, on set and I've had no time to my own. But now that the show is starting to come to a a uh, bit of a close. I'm getting a bit more time to start putting out some content for you. So I will do what I can to answer your questions if you have them. But that's it for now, guys. I'm going to take it easy, do some reading, just relax for the rest of the evening, and tomorrow I'll break the fast. So love you all very much, and we will see you next time here on the Free Melon Society. All right, take care, guys. Ciao.